evoking the wonder world of make-believe. To the faithful, it was more than a dream factory where one young hopeful out of a million got a break. It was dreamland itself, the home of the heavenly bodies, the glamour galaxy of Hollywood. Kenneth Anker, their chronicler born among them, who chose for his destiny not to record Hollywood heaven, but to lift the veil on Hollywood Babylon. Kenneth Anger was raised in Beverly Hills and grew up in 1930s Hollywood. He has written two books on the scandals that have littered Hollywood's history and raised gossip to an art form. He called them Hollywood Babylon, likening the legendary decadence of the ancient city to the unrestrained excesses of Hollywood's golden years. His own films have made him one of the most influential figures of underground cinema. Both his books and films explore the same subjects, glamour, illusion and human frailty. For Anger, the golden age began with D.W. Griffith, the outrageously extravagant director who dared to reconstruct the colossal court of Belshazzar for his 1916 epic, Intolerance. Griffith, riding high over Illusion City, lording it over his vision of Babylon. A mare's nest, mountains of scaffolding, hanging gardens, chariot race ramparts, and sky-high elephants. Paceboard Babylon a make-believe mirage of Mesopotamia, a gargantuan dream beside the dusty Tin Lizzy Trail called Sunset Boulevard. Camera! Action! 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 Griffith's Babylon something of a reproach and something of a challenge to the burgeoning movie town. Something to surpass, something to live down. The shadow of Babylon had fallen over Hollywood. I confess, growing up in Tinseltown, my childhood hobby was visiting cemeteries, seeking the resting places of my heroes, those with the fabulous faces of Hollywood in the 20s who had passed on. Carmen Miranda, Mario Lanza, Cecil B. DeMille. Well, we had... Um, Edda Hopper, Tyrone Power. And Peter Lorre, um, and Mae Murray. May Murray, one of the most beautiful and rich stars of the 20s, ended up derelict on a park bench. Tom Banks. Tom had a rainbow-colored fountain in his dining room and died in his hand-built sports car two weeks after receiving it. We had Gene Harlow. Gene Harlow's husband shot himself in 1932, humiliated after trying to pleasure the platinum star with a dildo. We did have Marion Davies. Mistress of both Charlie Chaplin and William Randolph Hearst, simultaneously. We had Norma Talmadge. Alcoholic. Marilyn Monroe. Suicide. Jane Mansfield. Decapitated. The death of the screen's great lover, Rudolph Valentino, on August the 23rd, 1926, released a flood of scandalous rumors. The official cause of death was peritonitis, but some attributed it to an arsenic revenge by a well-known New York society woman, others to a shot from an irate husband, or that he was syphilitic. What was known was that both of the women he married were lesbians, and that he married his second wife without divorcing his first, an oversight that led to his arrest for bigamy. Valentino's demise at 31 left inconsolable paramours of both sexes to judge by the tear-streaked testimonials. Aside from the lady in black bearing flowers annually to the mausoleum on the anniversary of his death, 
the memory of Rudy was cherished by matinee idol Ramon Navarro, who kept a black lead Art Deco dildo embellished with Valentino's silver signature in a bedroom shrine, a present from Rudy. Valentino died in, in August 1926. The cult of Valentino has attracted several women, some of whom I think are on the fringe of sanity, who uh, appear regularly at his tomb dressed in black and who fuss with it and, and put flowers and things like that. Valentino, I'm here every single day to bring flowers, to bring prayer, and to bring my love. Y yo, sweetheart, sing a letter, oh goodbye. It's no secret, you feel better if you cry when waiting for the bluebird that sometimes come. So lay your head down and cry. Valentino. When I found Valentino's tomb, it proved a disappointment. It was nothing special, just a space on the wall with two dinky flower vases, like those in an old-fashioned limousine, with Rudy's name spelled out in bronze in the long version. Still, I was drawn back again and again and again. These visits were charmed. There was never anyone else around. I had Rudy all to myself. For a long time, like grandmother, I didn't believe in death. It was just a transition, a special effect lap dissolve. I firmly intended to approach my idols as their equal. After all, I too had once acted in a Hollywood movie. would glisten and it's a rather intoxicating smell and it was it was a wonderful thing for a four-year-old kid to to work in because for a four-year-old it was gigantic did you go to see a lot of movies oh a lot yes my grandmother was a movie buff and she'd take me once or twice a week when I was really quite small and then I when I started to go on my own I never missed a Saturday matinee and she told me many a story, which maybe weren't too suitable for children, but at any rate, they were the equivalent of grim fairy tales of the silent days. And I began keeping a diary of all the things that happened when I was growing up. Thelma Todd's murder or suicide that happened when I was a little boy. Lupi Velez's suicide that happened when I was in Beverly Hills High School living a few blocks away. These things made a tremendous impression on me and I cut out all the press clippings about it. But it was always looking forward to someday I would do something with these and years later they turned into the series of Hollywood Babylon books. In 
1921, Fatty Arbuckle was the most popular and wholesome family entertainer in the movies. And when he signed a new $3 million contract with Paramount, he got straight into his custom-made Pierce Arrow and headed for the luxurious Hotel St. Francis in San Francisco to celebrate. Fatty booked three adjoining suites on the 12th floor, enough room for any developments. Booze was still illegal in California, but Fatty phoned his bootleg connection, Tom Tom the bellboy, and the party was on. Seven years earlier, Fatty Arbuckle had been a hefty plumber's mate, discovered by Max Sennett when he went to unclog the comedy producer's drain. By the week of the party, he had six full-length features and 27 two-reelers showing. He was a generous party giver, and a good-sized crowd of his movie colony cronies and assorted hangers-on were soon having a good time. Amongst them was an obscure starlet. Virginia Rappé was a bit part actress at Max Sennett's studios. Fatty had had his roving eye in Virginia for some time and asked her to play the lead in one of his films. She seemed to be on her way. Unfortunately, when she did find instant renown, it was because of what happened that day in Suite 1221, and she was in no position to profit from her fame. The party was in full swing when Fatty ended up in the bedroom with Virginia. Next thing, Fatty emerged, saying the girl was sick and needed help. A week later, Virginia died. that interest me are not just the sordid little stories of Holly, but, but somehow they transcend into uh, tragedy. I mean, they've got to have an element of grandeur to them, something. It's the contrast of the fame and glory and then the all-too-human uh, tragedies that often wipe them out. As headlines screamed, the rumors flew of a hideously unnatural rape. Arbuckle, enraged at his drunken impotence, had ravaged Virginia with a Coke bottle or a champagne bottle, then repeated the act with a jagged piece of ice. Or wasn't it common knowledge that Arbuckle was exceptionally well endowed? How could Hearst print this? I mean, this isn't news. This is totally unfounded gossip. I thought he liked me. Or was it just a question of 266 pounds too much of fatty? flattening poor Virginia in a flying leap. What was certain was a leap in circulation. The tabloids had a field day, printing insinuation about Arbuckle's bottle party. When Fatty was charged with Virginia Rappe's rape and murder, all the world knew the young actress's name. The state of California blamed her death on external pressure applied by Arbuckle during sexual dalliance. A forlorn fame for Virginia, a heavy rap for Fatty. Murder won. He could go to the gallows. Fatty suffered through three trials and was found innocent each time, but the public found him guilty. Arbuckle's films were withdrawn. His three million dollar contract was cancelled and his unreleased films were junked, causing the studio a cool million dollar write-off. Fatty the funny man, never convicted of any crime, was finished. The Prince of Wales had been harpooned. He died broke, drunk and broken at the age of 46. Hollywood now meant more than dreamland. 
it was forever linked with scandal in the minds of millions. Down the aisle, another Woodbury bride. She uses Woodbury soap because it's gentle and mild. Jurgens Lotion and Woodbury Soap present the Luella Parsons Show. It's the lotion that's preferred by more women everywhere. That girl who sent poison pen letters from Jamaica about Errol Flynn is in for serious trouble. Errol has talked by transatlantic telephone to his lawyer in Hollywood, telling him to take immediate action. The Bahamas Post Office Department is working in conjunction to track down the anonymous letter writer. And I hope they get her. And here is last minute news. Better actor, Spicy Hollywood headlines have always been good for business. And the queens of gossip were the original go-getting Paganini of Piffle, Luella, I saw what you did, Parsons, and her arch-rival, Hedda Hopper, regularly spilling the steaming beans on who was Hollywood in and Hollywood out. I may have forgotten the name of Lou Telogen, but as Harry Carey's suicide our own Hollywood star, Jimmy The public's craving for a non-stop movie star titillation fix was mainlined and bylined day by day by these two cities. Indicated mutant sob sisters. The girls got so excited. For Hedda and Luella, there was no better place than Hollywood, reborn Babylon. And their decent, outraged voices confirmed that behind every closed door and window, glittering, soulless women wandered from wicked to wanton orgy on the tuxedoed arms of vainglorious males through a moneyed, perfumed world of drink, dope, and much, much worse. Virginia Hill, former girlfriend of Bugsy Siegel. Expected the police dressed in women's underwear, hanging from a shower rail. At the price Hot of off my Hollywood wire, Merle Oberon phoned to say she's off to Mexico to divorce. It was not sort of her mother's sudden death last night until after she finished her show. It was early morning before she flamed to Los Angeles. And, she was and how about Lionel Atwell's 1940 Christmas party? He fancies an orgy after dinner. They even have a blind pianist play the Blue Danube. As he strikes up, that's the start signal. And off come the tuxedos and Adrian evening gowns, sulka shorts, and Antoinette lingerie. Just to stay decent, they keep their jewelry on. And then they watch some of Lionel's special films. Not many Academy Awards on view. The original casting couch was a piece of furniture in the office of Max Sennett, and it's where he <coughs> interviewed the various Max Sennett bathing beauties, and they did um, put out. And the other most famous casting couch that was actually a separate bedroom behind the office of Daryl Zanuck at Fox. And he wasn't to be disturbed any afternoon, Monday to Friday, from 4 to 5. That was the bedroom hour. It was what you call phallic power of the producer. Have you ever refused to do a publicity stunt? I mean, is there a kind of publicity you try and avoid? I've never done a publicity stunt in my entire life, and I never will. If the time ever comes when I will do a publicity stunt, then I'll be 150 years old. Glamour is something that you get trapped in. The Chinese uh, fled from the cameras. In the back in the 19th century. I think they were on to something, but I think we have to deal with it. I think we have to have enough soul that we don't mind having a little bit stolen. And I think what we see on the screen that's fascinating is when we do see some soul up there. For instance, I think the mystery of Garbo is that you were seeing a bit of Garbo's soul up there. You did go as far as describing the film medium as evil. It's an evil I'm perfectly prepared to deal with because I, I recognize that it has that glamour in the old sense. 
but i love it and so i feel safer working with it since i recognize that my family had a sixteen millimeter cine kodak and so i began making my own little films with the family cine kodak but i modeled myself after Hollywood professionalism. In other words, I wanted good lighting and I, I wanted to make the camera do things like I'd seen in, in professional films, even though what I was doing was quite different. shadow and the contrast of, of good and evil. And I find the vast allegories of good and evil reflected in a very vivid way in show business. So in a sense, that kind of allegory run through Hollywood Babylon. Have you taken a bottle of Nimbutal? Uh-huh. How many did you take? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Who found you? Count what really happened on the night of April 4th. Whether Cheryl Crane, the 14-year-old daughter of movie star Lana Turner, had killed her mother's gangland lover, Johnny Stampanato. I swear it was so sad. I... Even a last-minute interruption in the best of Hollywood tradition took place by a man who burst in yelling, it's a pack of lies, I want to testify, then rushed out. Twenty-one-year-old Lionel Williams of Los Angeles was serving time in Michigan when he was charged with the actor's murder. Minio was stabbed to death with a hunting knife on February 12, 1976. He was heard crying for help outside the garage of his fashionable apartment building. It has to be have an element of the bizarre truly to interest me. Like in the death of Marie Prevost, she was a Max Sennett bathing beauty who then became a star in the 30s and fell on hard times. But the fact that she died and was shut up for two weeks in her little apartment with her dog, 
and the dog survived by chewing on her legs and eating them. It makes it fascinating for me. It makes it a Hollywood Babylon story. Every scandal sent shivers to the expensively clad charm circle. But the revels went on unabated. <laughs> Gonna take a sentimental journey. Gonna set my heart at ease. The new gods were determined to Gonna live their own legends to the hilt. Whooping it up in an atmosphere of staggering luxury, in dream castles like Valentino's Falcon Lair. The excesses of these stars developed a cynicism and a defiance characteristic of jazz age youth. Bitterness and darkness often lay just beyond, but their attitudes seemed to be, so what? They soaked boudoirs in Shalimar, and a $3,000 ball gown lasted the life of a party. Any star could buy the key to a dream paradise. As if dressing up under the Klieg lights all week long wasn't enough, a favorite divertisement was the costume party. Here is Gloria Swanson as Helen Hayes in The White Sister. What a Gloria Swanson Gloria spent a quarter of a million dollars a year on her dresses alone. Oh, the parties we used to have. In those days, the public wanted us to live like kings and queens. So we did, and why not? We were in love with life. We were making more money than we ever dreamed existed, and there was no reason to believe it would ever stop. She wore blue velvet. Bluer than velvet was the night. Softer than satin was the light from the stars. Saturday and saw these fellows, the bikers, on these elaborate show bikes. And um, I admired their machines and asked them if I could photograph them. And they said, yes, sure. And that was how Scorpio Rising got made. When she left, gone was the glow of things like blue velvet while I show a biker getting dressed in jeans and putting on his black leather jacket so it has an ironic comment on on his narcissism which it is when I was cutting the film a film was delivered to my house by mistake and it was left on my doorstep literally and it was a, a Sunday school film called The Last Journey to Jerusalem. Well, I called it a sort of a, an, a gift from the gods that it had dropped down. I ran it and I said, well, I'm just going to work it right into my film. And so the whole sort of parallel cutting of Jesus traveling into Jerusalem was intercut with the, the, the bikers. I took it as an act of uh, magic that, I, 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 that it was delivered to me at that time. Well, I, I was making films the way someone else would write a poem, and these were personal artistic statements. And so, unless I found a uh, some kind of uh, patron, <laughs> 
I, I could hardly expect, you know, for studios to back this kind of film, and I, I never did. There's no sense in which the books are revenge on Hollywood. No, I don't consider them that at all. And as a matter of fact, I love Hollywood. In other words, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's provided me with uh, a lifetime entertainment and uh, wonderful little insights into the human condition. It had many things uh, wrong with it. I mean, you know, abuse of power and so forth, but yet many things were right with it. And Hollywood made some wonderful films along the way. That was the idea of the old picture palaces, to create a dignified and rather awe-inspiring atmosphere for, for where the pictures were to be shown. The tower was designed as a talkie theater. It opened in 1927 with the jazz singer, its very first picture. And it lasted until 1989, and now it's a closed mart. <laughs> so it's, it's fallen on harder times. Shall we just have a cigarette on it? I'm just a, a chronicler of their foibles, follies, and excesses. Hello? Hello? Many of them came to rather sticky ends. Like some of them chose suicide and often rather dramatic self-destruction. Like this will be my last headline or my last grabbing of the world's attention. Hello? That's when we go out on this trip to get away from business. This is my two-time honeymoon. The first time we went on our honeymoon, we didn't go. But this time, the only business is going to be, is going to be nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, may we have a picture of you alone? Oh. Oh, certainly. I'll check on the cabin. All right. Uh, right over here, if you don't mind. I know what you want. Is this it? Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Lupe Velez had been part of the Hollywood scene since the late 20s, when the go-getting teenager had come up from Mexico City to conquer the movies. She made a film with Cecil B. DeMille, seduced Gary Cooper and Tarzan himself, Johnny Weissmiller. She soon earned the name Mexican Spitfire and was living in splendor in Beverly Hills. She was dead at 34. This was discovered in my neighborhood in Beverly Hills, and the maid let me in the kitchen door, and I was able to peek in the bedroom that was full of all these flowers and actually see dead Lupe among the flowers. I am very sorry all this has happened, Dennis, but this last time is the camel that broke the straw. Maybe you're happy because I'm leading. That's right. You mean to say you don't want me to stay? Of course not. The sooner you get out of my cabin, the better. Goodbye. Lupe's career skidded from A to B pictures, in which she served chili con Lupe parodies of her own spicy persona. The mortgage was overdue on her outmoded Zorro-era pile. Lupe was completely zonked by debt, and she realized she was pregnant. Harold Ramond, bit part player and father of her unborn child, had taken the news with his get-lost look, his so-what shrug. Suicide was the way out for Lupe. An old-fashioned star, brainwashed and brain-damaged by her own beauty and glamour, for whom the loss of the public, of fan mail, of image, was the loss of self. She planned her last night as punctiliously as an early DeMille allegorical flashback. After a last supper of chili con carne, brandy and cigarillos, she got ready for a big scene. The bedroom was Our Lady of Guadalupe's chapel on a day of days. Flowers, candles everywhere, everything aglow. Second all sleeping pills had always proved a popular Hollywood exit, and Lupe down 75 of the little beauties, stretched out on the satin bed, crossed her hands on her breast, closed her eyes, and thought of the next day's headlines. And indeed, in the next day's LA Times, Luella had the story. She described the still life at Casa Felicias. Lupe was never lovelier as she lay there, as if slumbering, a faint smile like secret dreams, looking like a child taking nappy like a good little girl. The actual scene had been something else. When Juanita, the chambermaid, had opened the bedroom door at nine the morning after the suicide, 
No Lupe was in sight. The bed was empty. The aroma of scented candles, the fragrance of two roses almost, but not quite, masking the stench recalling Skid Row derelicts. Juanita traced the trail from the bed over to the bathroom. There she found her mistress, Senorita Velez. The huge dose of Secanol had not been fatal in the expected fashion. It had mixed retrously with the Spitfire's Mexi Spice last supper. Violently sick, an ultimate fastidiousness drove her to stagger towards the sanitary sanctum of the Salle de Bain, where she slipped on the tiles and plunged headfirst into her Egyptian chartreuse onyx hush flush model deluxe. Well, I'm gonna get a policeman and throw you out! You must be inside the wait fuck. I'm not here. Don't you cause another scene. There's gonna be a key You're gonna listen to me right oh, now. Oh, now that you leave it. Let go of me or I knock you out. Every night I hope and pray a dream lover will come my way. Who poured a hope in my arms and know the magic of his charms because I want a boy to come my own. I want a dream lover. This is Sunset Boulevard, the fabled highway of the stars. Don't look now, but isn't that Jane Mansfield? Could be. She lives on this street. That is Jane Mansfield. She had her hair dyed for a picture. day that he came to Hollywood in 1910, determined to make a million dollars. Well, he made it. He was killed in this car two weeks after this picture was taken. How fast were your car go? Oh, an honest miles an hour. Clocked around about 106, 7. Oh, you wait a minute, Jimmy. Um, one more question. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Take it easy driving. The life you might save might be mine. You know. <laughs> well, the... Griffith Park Observatory was used as a background by Nick Ray for the film Rebel Without a Cause, one of the very few films that James Dean made in his very short career. It's amazing that he's made such an impact when he's really made only three features. After Dean died, his tombstone in Fairmount, Indiana, bore only his name in the stark dates 1931-1955. A brief epitaph might have read, pretty much of a tramp. The promiscuous dope smoker had trouble remembering his lines, fluffed his dialogue, and fumed on the set. He was basically gay and had taken to hanging out at the club, an East Hollywood leather bar specializing in the magic world of S&M sex. Dean was into beating, boots, belts, and bondage. When stoned, he would bare his chest and beg his masters to stub their cigarette butts out on him. They responded by tagging him the human ashtray. After his fatal car crash, the coroner made note of the constellation of burns across his torso. But if Richard Gere, Matt Dillon, or any of the other boring Dean clones were to suffer his fate, would cults arise, fans commit suicide, love notes turn up 30 years after his death? Doubtful. Jimmy may have had crabs, but he had durable charisma. Dean died at 24, Valentino died at 31 and others had their careers over and in a sense never recovered from the fact that they were once at the top even though they may have lived on for years because uh, Raymond Navarro died at 69 but he never got over the fact that he, he was once a top mat matinee idol and so his later years were quite 
quite sad. I have very few friends, and I'm glad of it too, because there are, you never have many friends. You just can't. You just can't. You just can't. You just can't. Ramon Navarro's ghastly death by beating in 1968 brought to mind the bizarre crimes of Hollywood's past. Here was a man dying as he had lived, extravagantly, choked in his own blood. The lead Art Deco dildo which Valentino had given him 45 years earlier thrust down his throat by two small-time hustlers looking for his petty cash. Star System survived scandal after scandal. MGM launched the motto, more stars than there are in heaven. Although the stars themselves wondered how long they could stay in orbit. As May Murray said from the perspective of 20 years, we were like dragonflies. We seemed to be suspended effortlessly in the air, but in reality, our wings were beating very, very fast. There's a new star in heaven tonight that may never fade from our sight. Yeah. 
seldom comes. They have looks, perhaps talent, and pose. But take it from us. Girls who go Hollywood sometimes go hungry. Peg Entwistle started a trend with her fall from grace. Peg was in a couple of Broadway plays, but thought she'd try Hollywood when the crash came in the 30s. She lived with an uncle on Beechwood Drive and was in one film, 13 Women, in which the young blonde is haunted by the fear of committing suicide. That's silly. A man I've never seen. He has the nerve to tell me that I'm going to kill myself. Oh, are you going to bed? Yes, it's so late. We'll be in Los Angeles in the morning. I'll see you at breakfast. Fine. If I were you, I would... This? <laughs> Don't worry. No stars are going to twinkle, twinkle me into committing suicide. When the parts dried up, Peg became more depressed. Hollywood's a lonely place for those who haven't made it. The handshakes are reserved for those who have. The nine tawdry letters on the hill above her house started to haunt her. And one night she found the way up in her own fashion. Not an easy task in high heel shoes and evening dress. It was a shame that in her one film, Peg had watched someone plunge to her death. These ideas stick. <laughs> She left her clothes and purse on the ground and climbed the 50-foot H. No one will ever know how long she gazed down at Hollywood that night, or her bitter thoughts. She could see several of the studios from her privileged position. Then she leapt to her death. She didn't know that at that moment in the post was an offer of a job. The juicy role of a girl who commits suicide at the end of the third act. and magic is not illusionist magic like pulling rabbits out of hats. I mean, that's an art that I respect, but this is supposedly the real thing. And I've seen it work enough times. I know it's there. It's like a background. It's like a wavelength, a little bit like um, radio waves. It was very difficult to, to work on that film for everyone who was involved um, because he never told anyone anything. And one of the worst things was the scene in the, in the cemetery. It was really quite weird, and it was a sunrise, and I was sort of crawling around on my hands and knees among all these, this cemetery life, you know, with Max Factor blood everywhere. But he was very sweet, and he would tell me what he wanted me to do. And I'm, well, I'm, of course, I'm not a real actress, so I didn't have the skills to say what is the meaning of this thing you know I didn't know how to do that I played Lilith very bad <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Lilith was the first wife of Adam, the non-human wife, the demonic wife of Adam. We're dealing with uh, uh, Alistair Crowley's idea of a ritual, which is called the dramatic ritual, where you impersonate a god and then become that god. So you, you meditate on a god, say, like um, the god of love, and then you become, the, you become love. Or maybe you meditate on the, the god of war, Mars, and become Mars. And the idea is to control it, to feel the god force come through you and to manifest. My, my vision of Hollywood was very colored by Kenneth's book, you know. Um, I found it absolutely fascinating. And um, it brought it all to life for me somehow. And I understood more about glamour and illusion and it's something to do with going as far away from, from truth as you can possibly get. But that's Hollywood, I suppose. That's our image, my image, of, of what it's all about. I walk along the street of sorrow can take a kiss without regret till they forget their broken dream you laugh tonight and cry tomorrow when you behold your shattered scheme but she go low and she go let wake up to find their eyes are wet with tears that tell a broken dream. Certainly Hollywood still has scandals. I mean, they range from everything when, from John Belushi's overdose in a bungalow at the Chateau Marmont Hotel to uh, David Bagelman, a top producer, forging checks, even though he was a rich man. And no one has yet figured out why he did it. But somehow they don't quite measure up to the old scandals of, which was in a more innocent age, it was more shocking because these were more idealized people. The joy that you find here, you borrow, you cannot keep it long at sea. the 60s, old Hollywood had died. The battlements of those feudal kingdoms, the studios, fell one by one to the enemy, television. On the empty stages at Columbia, they host game shows these days. The mansions of the stars have crumbled. The swimming pools are empty. The tennis courts overgrown. Sarah Bernhardt believed the movies promised immortality. But in truth, they disappoint like any mere mortal. They grow old and wrinkled, get folded, spindled, and mutilated. Their blooming colors fade like the people do. And like lovers, many explode into flames and disappear without a trace.
yet sometimes in Hollywood, after fierce rains and winds have swept the skies clean, the Egyptian blue appears over the palm trees like a vision, the hulking obsolete sound stages like secretive tombs ever present. And we can't imagine what drew the ambitious and reckless men here an age ago. 